Thank you for listening to this podcast from TRE. Talk Radio Europe, your voice in Spain and around the world. For more information, please visit tre.radio. Discuss, challenge, inform, comment, viewpoint on Talk Radio Europe. Giles Brown. Live comment and discussion with studio guests. Viewpoint. It is Tuesday the 14th of May. Welcome to yet another Viewpoint with me, Giles Brown, live from the studios of TRE Talk Radio, your voice in Spain, with you for the next two hours, uh, discussing issues that are crossing your radar. We're going to be looking at the situation uh, with the defection of the Tory MP, uh, Nicola Elfric, to the crossing the floor to the Labour benches. What does that mean uh, for the Labour Party? Should they have admitted uh, Ms Elfric? into uh, their ranks as it's causing some uh, some consternation against uh, the Labour MPs or some Labour supporters as well. Also, uh, we're looking at the uh, latest situation uh, happening with regard to the Trump trial and anything else that is crossing the radar. If you want to get involved with the show today, then these are these are the numbers. To contact TRE, please call 952 78 4000. Email studio at tre.radio. Send us a WhatsApp on plus three four six four five ninety nine sixty seven ninety five. Message us on Facebook, Talk Radio Europe Official, or tweet us at tre Talk Radio. But first of all, let's have a look at what's making the front pages today. Uh, the Metro leads with a king saying, "I lost my sense of taste." The Financial Times leads with a story about the takeover proposal between two titans of the global mining industry. The Guardian's top headline, a a Labour-commissioned report calls for rent caps to tackle the housing crisis. The Daily Telegraph leads with China's reaction to three people who were arrested in the UK charged with spying for Hong Kong. The Daily Mail leads with claims that uh, Ozempic slashes heart attack and stroke risks. The Times has more on that. That story, weight loss jab reduces near heart deaths by a fifth. Dell Express also leads on the jab hailed as a new statin, cutting weight and saving lives. The Mirror features a story of how families of FA Cup players face having to pay their own way to watch the final as the club acts as perks to cut, cut, cut costs. So those front pages in detail, the eye reporting that Britain is now one of the most nature depleted countries in the world. That's according to several environmental charities. British Nature in Crisis reads the headline. And every political party failing to save wildlife. The Times, uh, the Times leads with um, millions of Britons could be prescribed a weight loss injection uh, to cut their risk of heart attacks and strokes by a fifth, which is weight loss jab reduces heart deaths by a fifth. Uh, King has revealed he lost his sense of taste during his treatment for cancer. Chipper Charles gives cancer updates. King, I lost my sense of taste. Meanwhile, The Guardian leads on a Labour commissioned report that calls for rent caps to tackle the growing housing crisis. Uh, Labour report calls for rent caps. Uh, and also Trump told me to, bur- to bury Danielle's story, says Cohen. This is, of course, uh, happening over in the New York. Uh, meanwhile, the Daily Mirror, uh, find your own way to Wembley. Official trip for families to see the FA Cup final is facing the axe. Uh, Man United to tell the wags. The Dell Express, game-changing new statin, cuts weight and saves lives. That's on the front of the Dell Express. Uh, the Financial Times, Anglo-American has rejected, an, has in, in rejected an improved takeover offer from BHP, intensifying the battle between the two mining giants. That's in the Financial Times. Uh, Anglo rebuffs sweetened. Uh, 34 uh, billion pound bid by BHP as significantly undervalued. Meanwhile, Daily Telegraph leads on the arrest of three people accused of spying for Hong Kong on pro-democracy activists living uh, in the UK. China fury at arrest of UK spies. Uh, The Daily Mail... Ozempic slashes heart attack and stroke risk. Top cardiologist says we should prescribe fake loss jab to millions. You're right there. And, sorry. Sorry? 
It's raising the chair. It's raising the chair, right, fair enough. And uh, finally, looking at the Daily Star, former US, US President Donald Trump has praised the fictional character Hannibal Lecter as a wonderful man. Uh, nothing at all, nothing weird here. Just the future US president is praising fictional cannibal. The late great Hannibal Lecter is a wonderful man. And, uh, those for better or worse are your headlines on this Tuesday, the 14th of May. To contact TRE, please call 952 78 4000. Email studio at tre.radio. Send us a WhatsApp on plus three four six four five ninety nine sixty seven ninety five. Message us on Facebook, Talk Radio Europe Official, or tweet us at TRE Talk Radio. And as you may have heard, joined in the studio by Alf Brewer. Morning to you, Alf. Good morning. I, w- I wasn't doing that whatever it was for. When a guy... And oh, right, okay. Animals. No, no, no. That no. was the chair. That was the chair going, was it? <laughs> Are you sitting comfortably then? Good to have you with now. us. I am now. One, Thank one, you. Wonderful. Well, it's been an interesting... Welcome to everybody else. Well, exactly. It's been an interesting week, hasn't it, to put it mildly, for uh, for for people crossing in British politics. I mean, we've had Rishi Sunak yesterday making this quite a, an interesting speech where he, he had a scattergun appear, a sort of a scattergun approach to uh, his... his. Uh, it was a sort of smorgasbord, a, mix, a, a pick and mix, because he didn't... He was going to say that... Uh, the UK uh, is facing a time of great danger and the only person you can sort of keep, the only party you can trust in these times of danger, the Conservative Party. But then he went off and saying uh, all sorts of, uh, it was a real sort of mismatch. And this is at the end of a week that saw the former MP for Dover, Nicola Elphick, if my memory serves me correctly, crossing over in a surprising move, you would say, from, uh, you know, from the Conservatives to Labour. And it sort of unleashed, um, some raised eyebrows in the opposition benches. You'll take on this, Alf, because, you know, we haven't got our Labour mugs on today, but they're upstairs. Um, He's holding, sorry, my apologies, I didn't see that. You are holding a Labour <laughs> mug. Um, 952 Yeah, but, um, yeah, well, anyway, I have various people have been nodding sagely at that one. Um, interesting one, people are saying this is a, a bad misjudgment by Starmer. Is it just the fact that we're going to, they're going to take, take anybody in now because it's, it's, it's snubbing, it's a kick in the proverbials for, for Sunak's government? No, and I think what we're seeing, you, you'll recall months ago I said, this is this is not quite like 1992, and it's not quite like 1997, but there are a lot of similarities. And what we're seeing is the it, it, you can go back every election that I can recall, and the Tories always start. So, so what Sunak was doing was launching his platform. Yeah, it's his election platform. Let's move this yeah. microphone a yeah. bit. So there you go. So, I feel like I'm... I know, I know, he's bumped up right there. <laughs> Uh, it's, he's launching the, the Tory manifesto without launching the Tory manifesto because it's too early. I mean, he knows when the election's going to be, you know, without doubt. Uh, all of his advisors know when the election's going to be. He's just kept everybody else in the dark, which is no different to, to any other year for any other reason. And the same will apply for the Labour Party. They can't, they can't start issuing, we're going to guarantee this, this is what's going to be in the manifesto. Until the election campaign is actually formally launched and you launch it on your manifesto, everything else is going to be, guess what we're going to do? So Sunak did no different. And, and I say it's really strange because um, they're going on about Elphick. I mean, I didn't like her as a Tory MP, but there are certain things that happen in politics where he, even we have to swallow. And I recall in 1995, right. there was a Tory minister called uh, Alan Howarth, who crossed, who crossed the floor to Labour. And it was a big issue because he spent all of his political life uh, with Thatcher and Major and, and before Thatcher, slagging off the Labour Party, uh, calling us communists, all, all that sort of stuff, all the normal rhetoric that you expect, which if you're in politics... You under, that's that's just part of the part of the setup. So I nearly said game. Of, yeah. rich, I nearly said game, but yeah. we're, we're not allowed to call politics a game because it's serious. Uh, 
Um, but there was a guy called Alan Howarth, and he crossed over, and similar, but not quite the same. There was big uproar, big outrage. How can you take in? This was, this remember, was under Blair, so it was about widening the Labour pie. But it was also about how do you undermine, not the credibility, but how do you undermine the people in the Tory party who are already questioning themselves? One of one of the constituencies I covered, the, the marginal constituency right. of Eltham in East London, had had a, a bloke. His wife was an MP. She was an MP down on the south coast, and his name was Peter Bottomley. Everybody remembers Peter, but he's the he's the whatever he's they call him now, the father of the house. You know, he's he's the old fart in in the Commons who who survived. And we said at the time, even before he'd announced it, we said, here's a Tory who's on the chicken run. What's the chicken run? The chicken run is the, the, the sitting MPs who are looking at where they are, feeling unsafe, looking for safer Tory seats through the, through the selection process. And what you're seeing now with... All of these Tory MPs, never mind about the ones you know, as individuals, the ones who are saying we're not going to stand again, they're not the issue because they've already made their, their, their going, right. in, including Elphick. We're going, that's the end of them. But what it leaves is a, is a rump hole of, what, 90 maybe, maybe 100 seats, many of which will be fairly safe-ish Tory seats, and then you'll see the ones who are in the wobbly seats fighting to get into the safe seats. And that's the chicken run. Right. They're leaving there, you know, where they've been. Peter Bottomley had been the MP for Eltham for, uh, I don't know, 12 years, 16 years, a long time. And, and but the writing was on the wall, 52nd most marginal seat in the country. We targeted it and, and it was working. And you could see from local elections, from at the time we had European elections, we were winning everything there. So bottomly, you know, boom, let's find a safe seat. I think he's in, he's either in the next door or two doors along constituency from where his wife was the MP. But there was still uproar because with the Alan Howard stuff, yeah. Not only did this guy cross the house to come to Labour, but he was having to be found a safe Labour seat in order to do it. Yeah. Now, I had a friend, a dear friend of mine, he's dead now, called Reg Kelly, and he'd been working uh, to get a selection where he lived in, in Newport Gwent in Wales, Newport East seat. And along came along came Blair and the, and the Labour Party. This is why I say sometimes we have to do things that we're not proud of or we're not good of. They come along and said, we want that seat for Alan Howard. And it didn't matter you know, that Reg had been working it for five, six, seven years, that he lived there, that he was bound to be the next you know, selected candidate. It didn't mm. matter. Yeah. They needed that seat for Alan Howarth in order to appease the, the Labour Party hierarchy so that they could say, we've had somebody from the Tory party switch to Labour. No, no matter what he'd said or done or how he'd acted against Labour at the time, and that's no different to what you're seeing now, other, other than they haven't got that same process because with her, it's going to be a case of let's rubbish what she's done as an individual. What strikes me is, though, because, OK, so we, we're looking at the last possible moment for a general election. Yeah. Because, you know, Sunak... Last Sunak, six months, like, yeah. Because Sunak is looking for an upturn in the economy or something, yeah. or something, you know, an act of God, you know, a desire, yeah. something really good happening. They can yeah. go, look, this is happening. It's, you know, fantastic and we're behind that. Yeah. Or alternatively, something really bad, i.e., you know, a, a, a war or something like that, where they can go, you, we're the only party you can, you can, we can steer you yeah. through these choppy waters. Okay, so so that's happening. That that may say say. I mean, and careful what you wish for. But imagine he calls it the same time as the U.S. elections. You know, up for all the whole thing, it will be complete mayhem. But out of chaos, that might be the, the way. The there's way. no there's no way the Tories are going to call it the same time as the U.S. elections, right? Because they will get swamped out by the U.S. elections, and they won't be able to use the 
age-old tradition of, you know, let's slag off the opposition. This is not going to be about policy. Right. It's not going to be about the economy. It's not going to be... I'll tell you what the economy will be. You can't trust Labour with your taxes. That's that's the economy argument. Right, and the, you know, the other they, one's going to be They will put on... taxes up. Yeah, we're going to put them down, because they will. Mm. They will put the two P's, and that's not just newspaper talk. They've, they're pre-warning everybody there's going to be a two, part, two P reduction in tax. We dare you, Labour, to reverse it. Right, OK. And, and then it'll be, you watch Labour when they get into power, because you can't trust them on taxes, they will... Tax and spend. It's, how many years have they said Labour Party tax and spend? The second bit, defence. Yeah. What's the argument with? Well, I tell you what. You you supported Corbyn, who was anti the nuclear deterrent. You supported Corbyn, who was anti NATO. You supported Corbyn, who was anti. The, and you go, yeah, that's why Labour got rid of him. I mean, you know me, you know me a long time now, Giles, and it's cold. Yeah, the the fact we had Corbyn in the first place was just wrong. Um, And I've never, ever agreed with his sort of extreme left policies. Lots, lots of social and countrywide policies, yeah, like renationalisation of the railways and how you deal with education and the health service. But the rest of it is is just nonsense. So they will come out and say that, so they won't argue about Starmer's view on on the nuclear deterrent, on NATO, or how much money we're giving to the Ukraine because they haven't got an argument. Right. What they'll do is they'll attack Corbyn and Starmer's support for Corbyn. Well, he had no choice. And and Corbyn's no longer is, isn't even in the. He's not in the Labour Party. He's not going to be in the Labour Party. Well, I he mean, may he, actually be allowed back in. But in um, which case, they'd have to do the same with Diane Abbott as well. And that's been going on for for months, months as it is. Yeah, yeah. But you know, this is this. You know, people don't quite understand. Once once you've been slagged off once about how you deal with people, and you say we're going to have an independent process. The last thing you do is not make the independent process independent. So it won't be for the Labour Party. I mean, obviously, they will make the ultimate decision and the Labour Party NEC will make the ultimate decision. But I would I would bet I would bet that the independent people will be saying Corbyn Corbyn wasn't being anti-Semitic, he, just, he was misunderstood. I bet that's what they say. And then the Labour Party executive have got this real dilemma then because everybody, everybody, oh, I know in the party are saying, we all knew he hated the Jewish population inside the Labour Party. Mm. The Jewish population inside the Labour Party were the right of the party. They were never to the left, anti-communist, yeah, you name it. That's where the Jewish community came from, traditionally. So there's no way that that yeah, you know, it, it's, it's it's so the dilemma for the national executive is you're going to have this independent body saying he should be allowed in, and and the national executive saying, but he's anti-Semitic. We allow him in, and we we lose, you know, two thirds of the Jewish vote because that's effectively yeah, what exactly. will happen. Same as at the last election. So. And and you can just see all this. So the arguments for the general election are not going to be based on reality. They're going to be based on, we don't like you and we're going to throw mud at you until the manifestos come along. And when the manifestos come along, then you'll see the real election campaign. But up until then, I mean, Sunak was doing it yesterday, wasn't he? Well, Labour, Labour have had 14 years to come up with a plan. To, not the fact that we've been doing this for 14 years Absolutely. and haven't got it right, but yeah. what has Labour been doing? They haven't Absolutely. got a, they they haven't haven't got got a plan. plan. Yeah, really. But they don't have to have a plan. And, and also, they, he started by doing it. Putin lovers. <laughs> the Labour Party are Putin lovers. And, the, and then the next thing that will come out is, well, you know, the, the Labour Party is supported by these trade unions and, you yeah, know, the biggest trade union that supports them, full of communists. You know, the Labour Party, that means communism. Communists love the communists. Therefore, they'll be supportive of Putin. It's, you you could just hear it all coming out now. And I think somebody on the telly, was it yesterday, the day before, and they said... Oh, I'll tell you, it was. <laughs> I smile because I did some work for her and it's like, wow. Dawn Butler right. was on the telly on 
one of those evening chat shows, and she said, surely the British public can't believe this. I don't know how many times I've said on air, the British public will believe what the British public will believe. And it ain't going to, Dawn Butler ain't going to change that. Yeah. You know, if they say uh, Starmer's a communist, some of it will stick. Some people in Britain will believe that. Starmer is going to give up on our defence strategy. He's not going to go for the 2.5% of GDP. They can't guarantee now to go to 2.5% of GDP because they don't know how much money is left in the coffers. In fact, if there's any money left in the coffers, I will be most surprised. But getting back to, to, to Elf, I mean, yeah. you're saying we're coming up to, coming up to November. She's yep. not standing. She's no. not so right. So why do you think she, A, she did this because she could just sort of sit there quietly and, and, you know, let it all wash over and then toddle off to a place in the country or whatever? Or B, why Labour? Why not go and join Tice's lot and, and, and reform? Because you would think with her policies, where she's sort of demonised trade unions and, and you know, her, she had to put out a very quick thing about, you know, women's rights because of what her husband and ex-husband yeah, had yeah. done for. Why go to Labour and why not reform? Or is, it, is she really, you know, put, trying to put the, the boot into Sunak as a, you know, a woman scorn type thing? Because I think sometimes th- these people do realise, you know, they've been in politics for a while and they, and they have to say, what? What am I doing? Where am I going? What, what is this all about? She's already being accused of being right-wing Tory because because she she didn't create these policies. She followed others in agreeing with the policies. And you go, well, that was stupid, wasn't it? But as I've said, if you're, if you're an individual who wants to get on in Parliament, if you want to be even a, a little thing, if you want to be a... a a junior minister or a minister or a secretary of state or in the cabinet or or anything to do with with the Tory party hierarchy. If you want to do that, then you have to kowtow to what people say. But on occasion you go, sometimes, you know, I said these things, but I'm, I'm not sure I actually believe it. She is not her husband. You want to see a right wing Craphead, sorry for the version. I get away with that. Her yes. husband, her husband, you know, he was right wing of the right wing. So, but she's not him. And I think because of the split and she's pushing us, she's, she's going to look for a future now outside of politics. She's not going to go away. And if she wants to end up in, I don't know, broadcasting or uh, reporting or as an advisor or anything at all, she's going to have to create herself a, a new a, a new platform that she's got to operate from, and that's what she's doing. Um, I don't. I mean, I don't know the woman from from Adam. I don't really know Starmer. I've never met Starmer in my life. Um, I just know what politicians have to do in order to to. Get ahead. When Starmer was supporting Corbyn, yeah. it's because if you talk to any any MP, you know, other than the, the fringe parties, if you talk to any MP who aspires to be running the country, they will tell you how hard it is to be in opposition. There's nothing worse than being an MP in a place where you need to be able to get to a minister not, not to not to change their opinion, but to seek information or to seek help or to whatever. Nothing worse than if you're the opposition going to a, a Tory minister today because you need something done in your local hospital. Remember, I covered Elton. Uh, I also covered Woolwich and, mm. and Greenwich, and we had all the all the. Uh, uh, army hospitals and things like that, and we had lot, lots of that. And I cannot tell you how difficult under a Tory government a Labour MP going to a Tory health minister seeking money and support for a, a an army hospital in Woolwich, how difficult it was to get anything through because it was always seen as if we do that, it makes that Labour seat 
less vulnerable to us attacking it. And remember, Eltham, marginal seat. Mm. So they weren't going to pile, you know, millions of pounds into the, into the Royal Arsenal. Do you, do you think, do you think that Starmer's going to have a problem now there from the trade unions with, you know, with the pictures of, of, of him welcoming Alfred in and sitting on, sitting on the little chairs and shaking hands with a big smile on his face? Or do you think he's actually doing, in, you know, taking it out of the Willie, you know, the Willie Brand handbook and actually playing real politics? And it's, you know, my, my enemies, enemies, my friends dot com. <laughs> <laughs> keep your enemies close. Keep, keep, keep your friends, friends close. Keep your enemies, enemies closer. closer. Um, but, but, you know, you just, no, but, I don't think it's from the trade unions, she, you know, she like- will cause some problems between the trade unions and the, the Labour Party. But it will all be washed out. It's, 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 just a, it's such a basic argument. Do you want a Labour government? And, and so there's no other arguments. Do you want a Labour government? Do you think a Tory crossing the House from the Tories to Labour is going to be bad in the public's eye? Never mind about the trade unions who are effectively, I mean, they might raise a lot of money for the Labour Party, but in in voting terms, they're minuscule. I mean, I learned a lesson many years ago from my political mentor who said, I was amazed when we didn't win the 92 general election. Absolutely, absolutely amazed. And then I was even more amazed because within every union, there is a a Tory section. We had a lot of Lib Dems in, in the post office engineering union. Right. So we had you know, the, the liberal, liberal uh, telephone engineers group and we had the Tories. And, and my political mentor said, just, just remember... 100,000 people or 90 odd thousand members do not vote really much differently than the rest of the country. So you may think Thatcher attacking British Telecom and privatising it, all of our members are going to be up in arms and are going to do what the union says. You're just wrong. You just you just don't understand. In politics, people people would decide on the basis. Yes, they may have all been opposed to Thatcher privatising BT, but they weren't opposed to Thatcher's tax regime. They weren't opposed to you know, lots of things. So the Tories who worked for BT voted Tory. The Liberal Demor- Democrats voted Lib Dem. You know, the communists voted communists. And, and I worked with a guy who was a communist. He, he ended up being elected as a, a communist local one of them... I don't know, church things. I don't know what they call them. Parishes? Parish. Yeah, he was a parish councillor. And he got elected as a communist. Communist parish councillor. Parish, the communist see, parish councillor. You something in this show every day. One was the Liberal Telephone and Engineers Group, which I never knew, but that sounds fantastic. I'd like to get back li- to that. The Liberals and, and the Tories. And, 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 and yeah. your actual communist parish council. I can, yeah, I can imagine the yeah, first yeah. one that. My mate Terry, Terry Wilde, his name was. He's a <laughs> communist. And you go, how the hell did that happen, Tell? And you went, well, there was only two candidates and the other one was 94. Going to take a quick, <laughs> quick break and we'll be back with more Viewpoint. Viewpoint with Giles Brown. Always live, always live. If you want to get involved with today's Viewpoint, then these are the numbers. To contact TRE, please call 952 78 4000. Email studio at tre.radio. Send us a WhatsApp on plus three four six four five ninety nine sixty seven ninety five. Message us on Facebook, Talk Radio Europe Official, or tweet us at TRE Talk Radio. And these are coming in on the WhatsApps. Good morning to you out there. Dawn, do you think she got her House of Lords place in writing for, for crossing the uh, for crossing the floor? Do you think it'll be Lord Elphick of, of no. Dover? Okay. Fair enough. No, she's not interested. She said she's not interested in continuing in politics. But I think a nice little a nice little Oh goal. she'll she'll get a role in some in some company on an industrial basis as a, a political advisor to the company. How do you get things through Parliament? Mm. If you've been in Parliament, then you know how to use the system. Nothing but we all know that. You can't beat the system. You have to use the system. But if you don't know the system, you can't use it. And that's what most 
companies. You know, they, they, someone yeah, goes, smash, oh, smash the system off. No, oh, they're lobbyists. They're yeah. lobbyists. And they call, no, they're not lobbyists. They call them lobbyists because they, they're in the lobby talking to them because you can't go anywhere else to talk to them. You go to the lobby and say... And grab them when they come here. Well, or you, you, put, you, know, you can't do that these days, but you can put a bit of paper in to say, I'd like to speak to, and they'll go and get them. Um, but it's just... People don't understand that. You know, the, the Commons is a, a fairly you know, well-structured organisation that you, you cannot beat. So a lobbyist, they don't just come along and say, what's wrong is when you get ministers or MPs who underhandedly take money and pretend that they're not asking a question for money mm. or, you know, other than that, you just listen to some of the questions where you, not many people do. I'm just one of those sad who <laughs> watches a lot of Parliament. And you, you listen to the questions that are being asked. You know, when there's 20 people in the House on, on a specific narrow issue and they ask a question, you go, that's, that's a genuine one from a constituency person. That's one from a company. Mm. You can tell the difference between the two. The difference is is has that MP been given a brown envelope with a load of money to ask that question, or do they genuinely believe and work with? Because people don't understand that. Loads of MPs from all parties work with charities. They don't take money to ask questions in the Commons. They they do it naturally because they believe in the cause that they're, that they're dealing with. So, uh, But, of course, over... over Hundred years, <laughs> politics has become so blackened and sard yeah. that everybody believes that every politician is bent. Every everybody believes every politician lies. Everybody believes you know this. And then Johnson comes along, and of course he allayed all those fears, didn't he? <laughs> of course, of course, prime ministers don't lie. Really, you know, it's, you know, and junk like that. And also look with the post office stuff, people don't believe that. I cannot believe cannot believe that, that whoever it was, I, I don't blame him for not knowing the details, but the guy who leads the Lib Dems is saying... The horizon, talking about the Horizon, the horizon scheme, stuff, yeah. yeah. He says, when I was, and it was a Postmaster General or whatever, because they, they retitled it. I yeah. mean, I got my I got my school certificates from the then Postmaster General. Gosh, I didn't know yeah. I was going to join the GPO. Right. Uh, Chris Chataway, as it was. Right. Um, and... and I cannot believe that he knew nothing about it. Well, he, he would have known something, but he never bothered to put the effort in to say, what's all this about? Uh, I'm I'm the guy at the top. I go into Parliament and I answer questions about the postal service in, in the United Kingdom on behalf of the government. And I want to know chief executive or whatever they call them of the post office, right. I want to know what this is all about. I will make the decision as to whether I believe some investigation or not should happen, not you. Instead of that, yeah, he was lied to. What? Then you shouldn't have been, <laughs> you shouldn't have been a minister. If you can't see that you're being lied to, if the line is that good, when how many people, about 4,000 people knew about this scandal mm. before it had even come to the surface? So lots of, I mean, anybody inside, I, I worked for the, like I say, I started with a GPO, yeah. which then became post office, that then became the post office, that then Thatcher split into two because our pension funds were big enough to damage the economy, it was argued, and we became British Telecom and and the post office, Royal Mail, no, no, the post office. And then because the post office are huge, they split that up into how many, six bits or whatever, Royal Mail and this, that. In order to, in order to stop that, that, Big stuff, but the one thing they never split was was the top of the pile. There's only one chief executive of the post office, and that chief executive spoke about Royal Mail, about overseas telegraphs, about you know, you name it. They spoke about everything, included on occasion, even though it's not 
within their remit, they would talk about because we used to be one industry, lots and lots of the buildings were joint buildings. So, you know, you had a telephone exchange, the, the betting you know, bet it is the next door was a salted office and there was a common canteen. You didn't have two canteens. Well, we did as it happens, but that's because we weren't allowed to be subsidised like the posties were. <laughs> so our canteen was empty and the posties canteen was full of telephone engineers because it was cheap food. But it's just this this lack of understanding and people just let them get away with it. And you go, I, I'm not even... Look, and you know how bad I, I have. My recollection of names is absolutely poor. And it's to the lines we go. Morning, Corley. You're live on TRE. What's your name? Where are you calling from? What's your viewpoint, please? Yeah, morning, Giles. Morning, Alf. Sharon. Hi, Sharon. Hello. Um, is, had most, uh, I do have these absurd thoughts sometimes and think I'm going welcome mad. To, <laughs> welcome to our world, Sharon. <laughs> welcome to my life. <laughs> <laughs> but, but I did wonder, this, is, this was so weird with this elfic woman, I wondered whether it was a Tory plant sticking somebody in there who could cause trouble for Starmer. And I, I, I know it sounds weird and, and left field, but I, I would put nothing past them to, to try and oust Starmer and his, and his party. I don't know what Al thinks, whether, whether, whether they would do, I'm deadly serious, whether they would do anything as stupid as that. No, nah, short, short of a few pick picture shots and uh, the occasional wheel out, she will be well managed by the Labour Party. And if she dared, if she dared to step outside of anything that the Labour Party are doing, then she would be, cru- she wouldn't be crucified by the Labour Party. She'd be, cru- <laughs> she'd be crucified by people like you going, I told you yeah, so. Yeah, but, but, but she'd be hailed by the right wing press, wouldn't no. she? No, they hate her. You can you, if if they if the right wing press if thing, the yeah. right wing press liked her, she would have, she would still be today front page news, and she's not. She's the only news about yeah. her is how bad she is and, and all the naughty things that she's supposed to have done and all the all the nastiness and all that. I mean, you, you don't even. Sharon, you've been around a what, long what, time. What do you what do you think he what do you think he should have done about her? Said no or or um... no? I told you we live through it. With, with sorry, I missed the, I missed the beginning of the program. Oh, right. okay. Apologies. Yeah, we lived through it in ninety five with a guy called Alan Howarth. Who's a, who's a Tory minister who crossed, and he'd he'd spent all his lifetime slagging off the Labour Party and belittling us. And Alan Howarth, by the way, was not only was he in, in Blair's government, he was a minister. He's one of the few MPs who's been a minister in both a Tory government and a Labour government. Mm. So sometimes, right, she's not going to be like that because she's not. I, I don't know what her intelligence, and I wouldn't I wouldn't challenge her <laughs> intelligence. But she's, she wasn't that big in the Tory party. No. And she, and she would never be big in the Labour party. Because, well, uh, her views would stop it anyway. She, the, she, the, might just, she might just leave, might she? I mean, she's, oh, she's, she's going to stand aside. She's already yeah. said that. She's, yeah. she's, she's yeah, leaving yeah. politics. Yeah. And, and what, you, what you'll end up with is, do, I, I put it in a slightly different way. She's the MP for Dover. The yeah. single biggest issue that Sunak can't resolve will not be able to resolve, will never resolve, is yeah. the small boat crossings. Yeah, yeah. You know, Rwanda's an issue, small boat crossings is an issue, illegal immigration, uh, in per se, not people seeking asylum, illegal immigration. All of this stuff is going on. What better than to wheel out a woman who says, well, Sunak tried all that, didn't work, let's give, yeah. li- let's give Labour a chance. Because that's all oh, she'll say. Hopefully. Well, that's Thanks all she'll a lot, say. Bye. Thank you. Thank you, Sean. Thanks, Sean. Good Thank to hear bye from bye. you. If you want to get involved with the show, 952 Cent 4000. Quick break, and then we get into the last 15 minutes of the first half of Viewpoint. Viewpoint with Giles Brown. Indeed. 30 minutes to the end of the first half of the show. If you want to get involved. To contact TRE, please call 952 78 4000. Email studio at tre.radio. Send us a WhatsApp on plus three four six four five ninety nine sixty seven ninety five. Message us on Facebook, Talk Radio Europe Official, or tweet us at TRE Talk Radio. 
And looking at some of the WhatsApps coming in, morning to you, Paul. He said the he sent me a picture of Rishi Sunak standing in front behind the lectern and in front of a photo, will we call it, with Pollock's the exchange in the background. He says the arms on the lectern because he's got obviously the uh, the royal uh, the the, uh, the Downing Street uh, crest and whatever. The arms on the lectern should only be used for state announcements and not for partisan policies. Plastered all over the wall is the Policy Exchange logo, an opaque think tank that funds the Tories. Uh, Suspect Sunak is both courting right-wing think tanks to keep him in charge. Look at me, I'm your man, as well as using this for pseudo-preemptive general election framing. Somebody said he was kind of gaslighting the entire country the other the other day as well. Uh, and- Sorry? It was Dawn Butler again. Yeah? Yeah, she said he's, he's ga- gaslighting. gaslighting the whole country. Yeah. And also, uh, hi, Giles, this is John and Mihas. Read Sharon's comment. I sent this to Stephen last Sunday. I was just listening to the Laura Kussenberg show. They mentioned uh, Natalie Elphick. And with her past, I'm wondering if the move across the floor was a ploy to provide ammunition for Rishi to attack Labour. That would explain why she, why she did it. So sort of sacrificial lamb. <laughs> yeah. This is, this is a woman who hates Rishi Sunak and says he's, all of his policies about the river sea crosses and all that is all nonsense and rubbish and he's not done a good job and that's why I believe. So what they do is they send him across so that Sunak can have go at Starmer. Yeah, for, for accepting the, the issue. It's the, it's, it's the Trojan, it's the Trojan Elphic. They're the Trojan Yeah. But... <laughs> The only thing that the Tories said about her crossing over, really, other than slagging her off and undermining her as an individual, the only thing they've said is Labour will take anybody, and it's called as if the Tories wouldn't. Well, did you see what Count Binface said? No. Count Binface. <laughs> Beat Britain first in the... In the, uh, in the yeah, yeah. I thought that was brilliant, but... <laughs> Count Binface said, Natalie Elphick tried defecting to me first, but I said, no, I'm taking the trash out, not in. <laughs> <laughs> you see, that's all they could do is slag her off. They're not... There's, n- there's no... There's no substance. There's not... No, there's not enough substance to the woman she's never been involved other than being the mp for one of the constituencies that suffers get, from the crosses how did she get to become an mp because you know she, it was almost like the default oh well, you're married to the previous mp therefore he's well, he's, well, he's going uh, into jail you take over his role that's, no that's, well that's not, listen it's it's not difficult she it's that's remember it's not it's not the people of dover who made the decision it was the Tories in Dover, and and now we've got Elphick, yeah, who gets put in prison or gets his prison sentence. So they're they're looking at oh, he's got to stand down because they wouldn't have a, an MP who's in prison where well, you can't. I don't think you can stand as an MP and be in prison. Unlike yeah, America, the unlike MP, Trump, the sitting MP for <laughs> Wormwood Scrubs East. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So I know. So, so <laughs> e- effectively, they've got to find somebody else. She, I would guess, had been part of the Dover political setup with her husband for years. She may have even been one of those, you know, his secretary for a while and things like that. So she would know the people in the Tory Association. It wouldn't take much. To s- conservative wife who stands by her, fr- her husband in front of the garden gate when they, you know, he says. <laughs> <laughs> Unfortunately, my I was checking the farming goods website and it suddenly clicked onto <laughs> onto Grinder or whatever. I, I shouldn't say, but I always look at I always look at the Tory ex minister who goes on the television who talks about all this stuff. She's got a podcast and all that. All I all I envision is her husband sitting indoors watching the watching the porn movies that she claimed for through her election. Oh, that one, yeah. <laughs> Expenses. This in, this in from Brian. He says. <laughs> Jackie your, Smith, that, we your, don't mention it. Yes, indeed, we don't. It's a family show. <laughs> uh, I, this is from Brian. I said a while ago that this Labour Party is probably the most right-wing Labour Party uh, of all time. Um, no. it, time, life, no, right, right, sorry, most right-wing in uh, my lifetime, probably anyone's lifetime. When Natalie Elphick jumps ship, then you know it is. No. I've already told you, right? Ninety-five, Alan Howarth, Tory minister, crosses the house. Do you want any more right wing than that right wing? You know, Thatcher and Major. No, it's it's not true. And right, I've been a member of the Labour Party since I was, I don't know, a, a small boy, industry, and I, I've been brought up through lots of things. I was also the organizer 
or one of one of the one of the first people to start an organisation that's that's now effectively got some control over the Labour Party. It's called Labour First. We started as mainstream. We were the moderates within the Labour Party. We were always called the right wing. I come from London. You, you don't find many right wing Labour Party. You don't survive as a right wing Labour Party person inside the Labour Party in London. Yes, we're you know, some of us are, are slightly different. We're not all Ken Livingston uh, lovers. We're not all Corbyn lovers. I. In the 60s and 70s, I used to stand against me. I stood against the woman who was on the Labour Party executive in my constituency. I lost by one vote. If I'd have beaten her, I wouldn't have stood a chance of being elected to the Labour Party NEC. But it stopped what I thought was an extreme left-winger from, from getting a position. So... You, that doesn't make me extreme right wing. That just makes me opposed to the left wing. And where I was brought up, yeah, I, I worked because it was the GPO. We had lots of people who come back from from the Second World War. Yeah, and I cannot tell you how many of those, and they all got involved in the union, all of them, and they all took part. They didn't just join; they took part. And I tell you, the one significant issue was they were so anti-communist, it was unbelievable. But that was my industry. You only had to move into the docks, the docks, and it was completely different because the dockers there were more interested in, you know, how many oranges can we nick from a, from a breakage or how many bottles of scotch are they going for Christmas? Whereas their, their union people, who were staunch union people, were very left-wing, very communist. Yeah, I don't say this with it's not pride or anything. It's just it's just what's reality. So the Transport and General Workers Union was a left wing union, but I but I had oh I don't know how many twelve fourteen MPs sponsored MPs mm -hmm. of which at least ten of them were what were called in them days by the other two or three right wing Labour. And there's no such thing, by the way. I keep saying this. If you put the label on, fine, you put the label on. If I put a label on myself, I can guarantee you everybody will ring in and say, no, you're not that, you're this. This is from Graham. I think Natalie Elphick saw which way the wind was blowing and decided to switch sides. It's a strategic career move after poor election results. And this one in from Dorothy says, the Labour Party bring change by throwing out Diane Abbott and welcoming in Natalie Elphick. I think that's shameful. <laughs> They're not going to throw Diane Abbott out. Yeah, I mean, that's... But well, he's going to keep her in a sort of limbo then, aren't uh, it's, right? it's not, it's not going to... Oh, I can keep on saying it's an independent uh, uh, position... And I personally don't think they're going to throw Diane Abbott out. Diane Abbott, by the way, joined the Labour Party after me. Um, and I've known Diane Abbott personally. Well, I don't personally. She wouldn't know me if I, if she fell over me. But I've not, I've been in That's her... That's I can't get out of my mind now. Well, I've been in her... So remember, she was a London MP yeah. uh, and a London Labour activist and all of that. And, and when... When we swept the board of the uh, GLC elections, oh, when would that have been? 1970, wherever it was, when Livingston became the leader. And you go, that was when I learned about, you know, you want to see the night of the long knives? Never mind about the communists. The left wing of the Labour Party stabbing, you know, the right wing, the so-called right wing. They weren't. They were moderates. They were nice people. They were trying to do a, a decent job. And they just wiped them off the face. And we ended up with all these, and, you know, some of them good and some of them trying. Tony Banks was part of that. And I have a lot of time. Tony Banks was a, was an MP in my next door constituency. Chelsea fan. And well, you, you see, I know, they all have their failings, don't they? <laughs> um, but Tony Banks used to come to Eltham yeah. with a, with a, a team of people almost every weekend for over a year to campaign in Eltham because of his passion that he wanted a Labour government. You don't, you don't do those sort of things by being left or right. You do those sort of things because you're passionate about the type of government you want to see. And the one thing you don't want, you know, we don't want the Tories. 
we're passionate. We don't want the Tories. When when Brown, when I went back in 2010, I was working for the Labour Party during Gordon Brown's uh, election campaign. I was working in London. But, but when that happened... Yeah, and the issue afterwards, and I was talking to my mates, having worked for the party for six or seven months going back, um, and I was talking to my mates who were all in the centre of the Labour Party, don't get me wrong, and they, they were adamant, you know, it, this was about the, the Liberal, the Liberal Democrats doing a deal with Labour for Labour to be in power, not to do a coalition like they did with the Tories and everybody has seen their failure. I've just got a quick flurry of stuff coming in at the moment. Oh, quick flurry went, through uh, your head. Is that exactly. What's the name? <laughs> Robin's come in saying Natalie Elphick, she only got her seat because she took over from her now ex-husband, uh, Charlie. No one really knows what her allegiances were. I suspect... Here we go again. I suspect she may have been a closet socialist all along, <laughs> and now she's headed, hedging her bets to stay on the parliamentary gravy train. Well, there was no thing about her being deselected. No, she's, she's, she's not exactly. standing. She's standing down. She's leaving <laughs> politics. Stuart, Stuart's come in saying, try as I might, I can't find anything about Natalie Alphick that says Labour, or empathetic, or human. And, <laughs> and, yes, this is a bit nasty. And, and this one in from Graham, right? Which, again, okay, because you know what I said about, you know, Trojan, whatever. Yeah, so, yeah, Trojan also. Natalie yeah. Elphick is beginning to bear, you heard it here first, a, thank you, Graham, a striking resemblance to some sort of Trojan horse. Beware Tories bearing gifts. She's, she hasn't got any gifts. She hasn't got any. The only thing she's bringing is, I was an MP for one of the constituencies that suffered from the, from the, the cross, North Sea crossings and Sunak was rubbish at dealing with it. Is that the gift she's bringing to the Labour Party? Do you think Wolf Reform must be thinking we could have bagged this one if we got, if we got 30p lead? Well, no, she... because, because this is, this is the, the part of the country she's from is, is Farage's country. That's where he stood and failed twice. It's where he stood as a, as a local councillor years ago and failed three times. You know, it goes on, doesn't it? It's just. Yes. Do you think there's a sign you are now entering Farage country? No. Imagine that. <laughs> Absolutely. And luckily, like they used to have, was it here, was it? Mickey or now it was McAndrew. Yes, country. indeed. And on that bombshell, <laughs> we're going to take a quick break, go to national and international news, and then back with more viewpoint. Talk Radio Europe. Your voice in Spain. Discuss, challenge, inform, comment, viewpoint on Talk Radio Europe. Giles Brown. Live comment and discussion with studio guests. Viewpoint. Welcome back to the second half of Viewpoint. Today's Viewpoint with you for the next 52 minutes, give or take. Uh, I'd like to get your contribution to today's Viewpoint if you want to get involved, and these are the numbers. To contact TRE, please call 952 78 4000. Email studio at tre.radio. Send us a WhatsApp on plus three four six four five ninety nine sixty seven ninety five. Message us on Facebook, Talk Radio Europe Official, or tweet us at TRE Talk Radio. Welcome back, to the second half of today's viewpoint. Joined in the studio. Why Joined in the studio by uh, by Alf Brewer, of course. We're chatting about uh, Various various bits and pieces happening in the UK. People cry. This is thought when they crossed the floor. Did you, I didn't actually see the moment when she was revealed. But this is, I mean, was, there was sort of an audible gasp of surprise. Did she sort of pop up behind him like some sort of jack in the box when he welcomed her into the labour benches? No, but I started with Prime Minister's question time. Yeah. So everybody, everybody comes in for their seats early for Prime Minister's question time. So yeah. she, she took her normal seat which is about, I think, about four rows back and about six in. And then before before the speaker says, and now we move on to this on the timetable, yeah. she stood up, walked down the stairs on her side, crossed the house, went up... All of the gasps from the other members, presumably? Well, every, everybody's like, 
What the hell is she doing? Exactly. So she kept it a fair secret. I mean, obviously, from those that you know knew, it wasn't a secret because they knew. But she then went up about two stairs. It obviously saved her a seat. So she was effectively sitting behind Starmer. Yeah. And that's where they, and and she was sort of shown to her seat by. Labour MPs who were there to to organise it all. So it's very clever how they did it, and it's, it doesn't always happen like that. When Churchill crossed the floor, I was just trying to think what he did. He he did it during some. It wasn't during the the issue was it was done during Prime Minister's questions, not at any other time. Um, so there's a full house and everybody's waiting and expectant, you know. And all of a sudden, this, and I think most of the gasps came from like the SMP and, and D, I think the DUP were taken by surprise. Yeah. Uh, but some, somebody says, so, uh, this is Claire, amazing the amount of scrutiny that Natalie Elphick is under by the media. Now she's defected to Labour. Never heard of any of that when she was a Tory. <laughs> Never heard of her. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> the story. I when they come up, this my my wife said, "Oh yeah, some some Tory MP, Elphick has just crossed the floor." And I went, "Elphick? I remember an MP called Elphick, but wasn't he banged up?" Mm. Of course, it was a, a rush, so I didn't I didn't know her. Ma- the mail was interesting as well because it said turncoat Elphick. If you, if you had <laughs> mail mail on Sunday, that's a brilliant, <laughs> isn't it? It's a brilliant sort of word to use again. Turncoat. Yeah, at least they didn't call her turnkey. Well, exactly, but <laughs> for, yes. For the tower. Put her in the tower. Well, they're, and they're now, saying, they're now saying, oh, well, she was asking ministers to pull strings for against the, the husband's case. And that, of course, has opened up another can of worms because that's Robert Buckland, and he should have... He's saying, oh, yeah, well, he basically kind of sat well, on Jonathan, his allegations. Jonathan, what's his name, was on from the Labour Party yesterday, and, and uh, well, both Jonathans, both shadow ministers... Um, and everybody's saying the same. If he's now saying that she did lobby him, yeah. why didn't he do something about it at the time? Because it's wrong. It's just wrong. And it's not whether they did something parliamentary-wise. He should have been reporting her to the Tory party, and the Tory party should have investigated and dealt with it. And and the classic, the classic as well is... Um, What's her name from the Labour Party? Jess Phillips. Yeah. Oh, I have a tremendous amount of time for her. She's a, yeah. I, 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 I interviewed her. She was, she was, she was yeah, marvellous. She, yeah, she's so normal and so a good MP. Um, genuine, I think is the word. And that's the difference. Yeah. Genu- there are lots. It doesn't matter what political party they come from. There are a lot of genuine MPs. And And she was going on about... Well, I think they should all be investigated, and and it. The, but the media were blowing that up as if it was the the Labour Party were complaining that Elphick wasn't being investigated. But the reality is, the Labour Party will always have now a, a standard view about all of it. If somebody is accused of doing something wrong, there should be an investigation. Full stop. End of story. No argument. Get on with it. And in this case, it would either be by, uh, at the time, the Tory party themselves or a parliamentary investigation team. What you can't do is just ignore these things and say it didn't happen. So if if Buck, Buck, Buckland, Buckland, whatever his name is, Buckland. If, if whatever he says has any any relevance to what's going on other than I don't I don't recall any of this. If he does say something, then it's called then there should be a parliamentary investigation What's the thing? into ha- him. Exactly. Never mind about he's, he's, her. Called, he's, he's actually scored a spectacular own goal because if he's saying, Oh well she came to me, you know, if she yeah. she came she approached me to cover up my, my ex husband's court case. Yeah, but and, and that's not what he's saying, by the way, mm. according to what I've heard. What he's saying is she came to me to see if I would get the court case removed to a different court so it wouldn't be as as uh, public. That's, that's not the same as saying <laughs> influencing whatever's the outcome. All she was saying is, can we do it in a different court that's not in Dover so that, you know, 
and and there would have been a, a slightly different eye. It's a bit like saying you can't you can't do me in this court because too many people know me, and therefore you're not going to be able to get a jury that's that's uh, independent or whatever they call it. Yeah. Um, so moving it, and and that's what that's what I've heard. If he's saying anything different to that, then it's not about her; it's about him. This one came, this came in from Gavin. I really think the Natalie Elphick thing is a serious misjudgment by Starmer and senior staffers. I can't understand what potential benefit they saw from admitting her to the party. It's a Tory crossing the house to Labour. Labour are gaining more and more influence on what's going on. And the undermining, as I've said, if 80 or 90 Tory MPs, whether they leave or you know, whatever happens, is going to create all this, all these vacancies yeah, watch watch the animals scrabbling for. Oh, there's a there's a safe seat. You know, when when uh, Johnson standing down, there's a great big scrabble for his seat because it's a safe a safe Tory seat. Yeah, in London, yeah, it happens all of the time. So whatever Dover, technically, other than I don't know, a few hundred years ago, it might have been. The Whigs or something, but Dover has been a Tory a Tory seat forever ever that I can remember. It's a safe seat, yeah. So people will be falling over themselves to be selected as the as the MP. And what will happen now? I think <laughs> so. The Tories have got a bigger headache. They will not leave that to the local Tory association to decide who's going to be the candidate. That's for certain. This is this is in from uh, Dan, who says Buckland. This is this. The, yeah, yeah, yeah. Had a duty to protect the justice system and the House of Commons integrity by telling the Commissioner for Standards about this alleged uh, con- conversation he had. But I guess honesty and integrity isn't important for the Tory government. If if it, if it is simply about moving, c- could he? Is there any chance that he had an influence on whether a court case could be heard in, in a different court than the one that it was being heard in? Then I don't see any relevance to that. Um, you know, that's not that's not that's not saying we should. Uh, the the problem the problem that Elphick had yeah. is that he the, the, whatever his name is George Elphick, isn't it? Um, he was a popular Tory MP. I, perhaps they're in that uh, yeah, okay. one one trouser leg up in the air group, you know, whatever they call themselves, of of MPs who all do this stuff, and the ones who get caught, they all surround them and look after them. But evidently, I mean, with the way she's saying it is, that, you know, he had lot, lots of his friends were there, and lots of his friends were saying this, that, and the other, and they're all not only because they're protecting him. But I think they're protecting themselves as well, because uh, what goes bad on one? Charlie, Jeffrey Art, right. Charlie, Jeffrey Art, yeah, yeah. You know, and you go, Jeffrey Archer. If, say, if, you? Yeah, if yeah. people don't understand the damage that Jeffrey Jeffrey Archer did to the Tory Party, all right, he redeemed himself afterwards, but the damage that he did simply by, you know, was it lying lying to Parliament? It's just like. Untold, untold amounts of damage, but they still, they still let him. And there were still loads of MPs saying, "Oh well, he didn't do that much, did he? It wasn't really." A, it's a bit like saying Johnson never lied to Parliament. Uh, well, yeah. it was all, it, it was all, he was all didn't really mean it. He was just a bit of a Josh. Yeah, yeah, one of the boys. As, as lots of the Tories are. It See, would appear. Let, can, just, can I just uh, let's let's just move on to this particular one because otherwise we're gonna. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. But did you see that? Um, Talking to Johnson, Dominic Cummings. Have you seen this? Yeah. <laughs> the way he said that, Al. If you <laughs> well, don't it's know... Just, it's just amazing. Can I, can I, just, can I just give yeah, a bit of yeah, background? If you don't know that Dominic Cummings wants to spring back to the centre of British politics at the head of a new political party. Um, he's like the, 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 the former, and I love this, the former Downing Street Svengali... Right, Svengali. Svengali. Yeah, yeah. yeah, indeed. <laughs> um, says he's he's uh, he says if the Tories get a, a, a hammer blow in the next elections, he wants to uh, he wants to divert energy and money away from how to revive the Tories and how to replace the Tories. Yeah. He wants to launch a new party, uh, which has been called the Startup Party, but it won't be called that when it finally gets going. Apparently, which will be completely different from the other parties. He said. Um, 
He said it's going to be a new party focused on cutting immigration, closing tax loopholes for the 1%, as will be those elite in London, investing in public services, and dramatically reforming the civil service. It will be ruthlessly focused on the voters, not on Westminster and the old media, he told uh, the iPaper, and friendly towards all the amazing talent in the country, people who build things in the private and public sector. He wants the party to be filled with entrepreneurs, NHS workers and military veterans, but he's not released any details uh, about important factors such as its funding, membership or governance. So there you go. I mean, <laughs> and he smiles. He smiles because, you know, what a pile of non- This is, this is guy- an interesting bunch that entrepreneurs, NHS workers and military veterans because, yes. well, because nobody can say a bad word to say against veterans. Nobody has a bad word to say against NHS members. And entrepreneurs are the, I mean, even, even Sunak was going on this about but the great entrrepreneurial spirit of the British people. So therefore it's, that's a, but I mean, would you, I mean, Cummings, I, I mean, Cummings, come on. Yeah, I was listening to, was it John, Johnny Mercer, the yeah. uh, Minister for, vet, yeah. for Veterans. Yeah. And yeah, I have a lot of time for people like that. Again, it's called, never mind about his party politics. I don't, don't agree with him for one moment, but. Genuine bloke, a genuine person who genuinely cares about I caught about John Sweeney's issue. interview with John and Mercer about a year ago now, and he comes across as, he said, a good, you know, a, good, a good guy. Absolutely. But that, that makes a wild assumption that the, the last Labour defence minister wasn't like that as well, which well, he was. No, you, know, I mean, the, the, you see, this is the problem, and this is what we're going to get, Alf. As this, because as this, as we head towards this next election, where whenever it's going to be, got to be September, surely. But you're going to see, you know, we talked about the last election with with the whole Boris against against yeah, yeah. Corbyn being mud, but you know, being mudslinging and dirty, oh, yeah, yeah. And taking a, taking from the Trump playbook. Rishi Sunak is getting, he's going to get himself, they're going to get wound up for this one, isn't it? Because there's nothing, there's going to be, he's got nothing to yes. lose in this one, isn't he? But the he? difference, the difference is. Johnson could deliver those lines because he was a he was a showman. He was an entertainer. He was he, he is very Trumpish. Sunak will be given the lines by some scriptwriter from either number ten or from Tory Party headquarters, and he will deliver them like he's delivering a speech. And if you haven't got the persona, if you haven't got the charisma, if you haven't got that that oomph that goes with it. Standing up and saying, you know, Starmer's a communist doesn't sound quite the same as the way Johnson would say it, which he did. Yeah. And, and, and embellish it and, and use all the, everything that goes with it. Because all Sunak can say is, uh, I've been told by Tory party head office to say that Starmer's a communist. Uh, yeah, as if that's going to make a difference, and it's not. By the way, the last person who I recall being called the Svengali of number 10, was Mandelson. Of course. Uh, amongst many other things that he, he was now? called. Where's Mandelson? He's Lord, Lord Mandelson. He still yeah. does, uh, he's just... Uh, Rio de Janeiro. N- no, he's a lot, well, <laughs> prob- probably, or Mexico, or well, wherever. No, so yes, wherever the, his life partner is, was, is from Rio. Yeah, from yeah. Brazil. But he was... Um, Lord Mandelson of Ipanema. But he's he's a, a working peer. Yeah, what they call it a working peer. So he's not a guy, and and I don't think he can be bothered to just turn up at the Lords just for the sake of it. So he's not one of these who's turning up for the money because he doesn't need it. Um, what about this? he's the last person? But the thing about the Dominic Cummings thing is what he also said when he was launching this new party, and and, and everything you said, yeah, you have to go back over it very very calmly individually and go that's because the tourists think that's a middle a middle issue that's because the tourists think that's a middle issue that's because the tourists think he's looking for the center of the Tory. he's not looking but for the center that- of politics he's looking for the center and that's been that's been destroyed Already by the Tories, and have we not? And the thing is, though, that he's harking back to a centrist movement that perhaps doesn't, which may happen in Europe. Although we get more populous as we go, but no. but surely that centrist thing doesn't exist anymore. Because if you, if you look, look down to, if you look at, well, in which case, if we, if there's a centre, if, if there's a centre part, if there's a centre 
uh, leaning majority, then why aren't they voting Liberal Democrat? If, or, if there's a sense or SDP, of, because the Lib the, Dems as the, ain't, as the 80, in 80, 40 because, years ago, because the Lib Dems have never been and never will be the centre of politics, they're the indifferent of politics. They're the ones who can't make their minds up about whether they're left or right. They're the ones who hover over what they think is the centre ground. But you look, you look at their policies. Their policies are either left wing policies or right wing policies. In general political terms, not extremism terms. So the Lib Dems have never been a centre, so yet they try to project that. But then again, what party doesn't go for the centre ground of British politics? If you don't have the centre well, ground of British politics... Uh, reform and anything that Swallows get involved in. No, but it. even reform are talking about issues that they think normal people in the middle and it's this isn't about party politics this is about what the people of britain are going to do if if you go to scotland it, it's been for the last what 20 years you talk, it's nationalism it's about independence it's not now not anymore. That's well it's not now so it means that Effectively, does that mean that the Scots have moved to the centre ground? No, it doesn't. What it means is the Scots are starting to say, well, it's all well and good having independence, but independence with no money and no future ain't going to help our health service, it's not going to help our education, it's not going to help our social services, it's not going to you know, help mental institutions, it's not going to help... And all those issues... That are people issues. The the single I would imagine the single big, biggest issue in the UK that's very rarely talked about is is, is care homes. That's going to be a bit well. Let, I mean, because it's massive. Yeah, but if, for thirty, forty, even going back to when I was a kid, they were talking about injecting money into the care system so that you know if you got old. You, Never mind about selling your house, but you didn't have to sell your house. And all the trauma that goes with simply getting somebody into a care home that's good, well run, well structured, and doesn't cost you an arm and a leg. But since El Brexit, as we call it in these parts, Brexit? that's the one, yeah. you cannot get, you, you know, it, it was revealed in the figures the other week about the fact that there is a massive, there's a massive uh, the, the Short reduction, fall? shortfall, thank you, in the number of people yeah. who are going to work in care homes. Because the people who wanted to work in care homes have now been forced out of the UK. Yeah. I can't tell you. How well many, done. There's still lots of foreigners working out, but I can't tell you how many. My mum's in a care home in Chippenham, uh, which is not, you know, it's the cent centre of England and centre of middle class and you name it, affluent area. She's not, she's not affluent, but it's an affluent area. And I can't tell you how many times she says, oh, it's a, it's a different care of this week. It's a different care of this. Every week they almost change out. Mm. So even the ones they're getting aren't sustainable. They're not, they're not staying for, for weeks. And most of the time... If you talk, uh, occasionally I've rung up the, the care home organisation yeah. and you talk to them and, and their issue is quite clear. They don't have the pool of people of to, to dip into because the pool of people who they can, which, which are ex-Eastern Europeans, ex-Europeans, yep. people who, South Americans, who all moved into the UK before Brexit and all that, are still there. They've now reached the stage of being the same as people with people without employment in the UK, i.e. they don't pay enough money to entice them to work And you there. can't bring your family over anymore. Yeah, but, but they ain't bringing anybody because they already, they're already in the UK. Mm -hmm. This isn't people they're bringing in. These are people that are already there. Why can't they get enough of the people who don't work in the UK to work in the care Cause industry? Because it's, it's, it's bloody hard work, as we know. And they don't pay enough money. For the same reason you've got problems with, with nursing. Right. Except, so, except, except. so now you've got the second wave, so in order... To, to cover for those, you bring in a pile of people from from the U European Union or elsewhere, and you put and you pile them into the care system, and it works for a while, and then all of a sudden, they find out that you know there are other employment opportunities in the UK that pay better or is less stressful or whatever it is. And they move on, and that's where we are. That's where I see it. That's where they are in the UK. So you've gone past the non-working Brits to the uh, foreigners who've come in to fill. And now mm. there is no poll because they can't then dip back into Europe 
or for that case anywhere else because a lot of the care workers as well people I, I've banged on about this for a long time the people who were coming in on education visas who were allowed to bring their families a lot of their families worked in the care industry we're not talking about eastern bloc country people we're talking about Asians Southeast Asians uh, poorer uh, ex- Commonwealth countries like yeah. Australia and Canada. The number of people from Canada who come to the UK because they're suffering from their employment situation in Canada. Not that there's huge unemployment. And today they've just announced yet another increase, and it will go up again before the end of the year. The unemployment level's gone up to 4.3%. Yeah, I just I remember you be 40. I am the one in 10. Indeed. It's getting to that. <laughs> 952 seems to get a quick break and then back with more Viewpoint. Viewpoint with Giles Brown. Joined in the studio by Alf Brew. We're talking Trojan horses and the thought just struck me. Struck me. We talked about perhaps my, my theory that, of course, uh, Miss Elphick was a Trojan horse sent across. Beware Tories bearing gifts. And I just come up with the idea that the, the, the SNP, so that, you know, evil Keir Starmer. You know the, that one. Um, he's obviously put in Yosef as Scottish First Minister, so that he would he would he would implode when he mucks with the Greens and therefore drive the SNP voters into Labour's arm as part of his cunning plan to turn us all into a Stalinist nation. Alf, I just <laughs> <laughs> you got started for ten there. Well, yeah, it's a shame Jamie couldn't make it. Yeah, it today is actually because, Jamie. Yeah, because... sorry about that. Like, Jamie was in. Jamie was was come was due to come in yeah, yeah. literally to the last night, and then he phoned up and he said, "Look, I'm really sorry. he's you know he's unfortunately work commitments, and I'm glad he's yeah, you know, yeah. I'm glad he's busy uh, so because we were looking we were looking forward to uh, his his take on the world, which is always it's well always because I've spent working. because I've spent three years saying to him. What do you think is going to happen with the SNP? Are they going to implode? Are they going to do this? Are Labour going to ever come back in Scotland? And Jamie's been absolutely adamant there's no way a Scotsman's going to vote Labour again. And that's not quite true as we see it. Well, whilst I was on about it, uh, you, know, you, you mentioned that John from uh, Mias had... Is it Mias? John from yeah, Mias? John from Mias, yes. Um, who, who was the policeman in London... And I was wondering, because one of the things that happened, I don't know how, how long ago, well, I presume John's as old as me. Um, if he remembers... slightly 45 in that case. <laughs> I wished. Yeah, right. 45 around the waist. Um, <laughs> I was wondering, because my recollection, way way back again in the, in the 90s, when we was leading up to the 97 election, one of the issues that, that he's, again, is going to come up now was about policing and uh, policing in London specifically mm. um, because of the US embassy stuff and because of the marches and, and just because of policing in general. And I re recall distinctly at the time, it was Major um, who was saying, you can't, you can't trust... Uh, Labour with the policing, and, and then specifically, because it was Livingston, you can't trust uh, Labour with policing, blah, blah, blah. This was, what, a year after? Two, 18 months, two years after uh, Stephen Lawrence was killed yeah. in Eltham. That was, uh, just that was, that around was the 93. Corner. 92, 93? Yes, but the whole process. Oh, yeah, I, yeah, yeah. I went to Eltham in 94. That was one, my first job in the party. Uh, so I went there in early 94, and we went through all that. The Stephen Lawrence stuff went on for about three years. A, a mate of mine who used to be the DJ at Charlton. Never forget, that, never forget the scenes of them leaving the courtyard. Remember they were leaving the courthouse, and it was yeah, actually see, bedlam outside. Because, because I was working... In there, you don't see all that. I, you know, I, I never yeah. had time to see television news and things. I used to get home at 10 o'clock at night and see nothing right. <laughs> inside of my eyelids. So, but I used to hear what the local people were saying. And there was, there was a time when they'd already, there was a plaque on the floor by the bus stop. Yeah. That had already been damaged once. So, so the local authority said, Oh, we're going to put cameras up. So they put cameras, and one of the cameras was was mounted on a friend of mine. He he was the DJ at Charlton Football Club, and um, when they put all the white paint, they threw all the white paint and stuff all over the uh, the thing on the pavement. So the first thing they do, I said to my mate, 
you know, because we had to be interested from a political angle, and of course, my candidate, because it's publicity and it's about how he gets involved. And we said, so, so what did the CCTV show? And he said, nothing, it's a dummy camera. So right. they, they, they put it up as a deterrent, but they're all dummy cameras. And you go, and that was another big issue then about policing in London. Nothing was ever done correctly. And I think we're going to see that again. And I wondered if John remembered the comments that were made all the time about policing in London just to, before just the 97. Just generation. a quick one. I'm looking, I'm looking at something that, um, that uh, Paul said in with uh, Mrs. Natalie Elphick, Dover, Labour, there, right? <laughs> and it said... Um, the risk- <laughs> She's now. Yeah, that's what it says. It's looking at last night's... It's that uh, Robert Buckland didn't think his allegation through. He scored an own goal with his admission that Elphick lobbied him. She may not be a palatable pill to swallow, but in crossing the floor, she'll cause more damage to the Tories compared to Labour. One immediate effect last night, Elphick was amongst those MPs who voted for amending the risk-based exclusion policy to apply at arrest and not charge. This motion was passed by one vote. Wow. So, so she's had an influence already. already. Yeah. Just want to get, just getting away from Scotland, I know we're going to be a bit scattergun here, but because since we last met up, you know, there was the third term for, uh, for Khan, of course, in the city Khan. In the, and, he, and in one the, of many. I don't many, mean terms. One mean of many mayors that well, yeah. are now Labour. Yeah, I mean that was that was again. It was another fantastic fashion. results. And yeah, and yeah, it was. I mean, they. The, it was quite interesting to see the sort of speak that they were coming out from in the Conservative Party to try yep. and put a spin on that one. And Carl had no chance of getting re-elected. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's all. And now, apart from now Bin Face beating fiddled. Britain first, oh, which I thought was brilliant. I mean, I just that was just the thing to go for. Um, but we've got a call coming in, so I, I go live to the lines again. Morning, call you live on TRE. What's your name? Where you calling from? What's your viewpoint, please? Yeah, hi, Charles, and hi, Al. Ah. This is Johnny, Johnny and me. Yes, yeah. hi, John. <laughs> so, the, the, the only thing I, I, the thing is, I actually retired in 1988, and I'm 84 years old now, so I'm, I'm pretty well over the hill. Um, <laughs> well, the but, first flush of youth there, as, as, as Michael K. So Michael Kane always said. Uh, yeah, right. But it's, I mean, one of the things they, one of the things, and I've, I've read a fair bit about the Steve Lawrence thing since, and I, I see there was probably a lot of an amount of corruption involved in it, as it were, as to why it didn't get properly investigated. But one of the main reasons it didn't get investigated is that it was in 1993 that he was killed. Yep. Some years before that, probably about 10 years before that, the CI, the, the Metropolitan Police decided to like reorganize itself. Yep. So we used to have career detectives. So somebody joined the police, did two years on the beat, and then they applied to join the CID. And if they if they did their job properly and, and got whatever, they stayed for the rest of their service in the CID. So they became professionals in investigating crime. And then it, the uniform branch was a bit un, annoyed about this because the CID had its own hierarchy within the service. So they actually changed it round so that the CID would, became part of effectively the uniform branch. So as, as a, a DI and a, a DCI, I finished up with a uniform um, boss who didn't understand anything about crime, knew nothing about it at all. And they actually then, trans- they were transferring people on promotion. So a DC would pass a sergeant's exam. He'd go back to uniform for a couple of years or so, and then apply to come back as a detective sergeant. And then he'd pass the exam because he was out of his depth. So, and uh, as an inspector, he'd go back and he'd come back. And by the time he got to that chief inspector, or certainly chief superintendent, he hadn't got a really clue about criminal investigation whatsoever. Initially, it worked reasonably well because there were the old detective sergeants who never took promotion, who, who held it all together, as it were. But as they retired and left, it finished up with detective chief superintendents not knowing what they were doing. And then everyone wondered why the CID couldn't investigate the crime to save their lives. And that was the reason, because they weren't detectives anymore. And they still aren't. And they and they still weren't in Eltham. That was part of the issue yeah. in Eltham. I recall. Well, I mean, because I wasn't directly. I covered Eltham. Yeah. I covered Eltham because so I was a DI at um, I was a DI at Greenwich, right. um, and I was a PC in that area as well at one time. Right. But I was a, a DI at Greenwich, and I used to do like stand in when when the guy was off in Eltham. So I was a DI at Eltham, but I say I retired in eighty eight. So it was yeah. five years. Yeah, Eltham um, was Eltham was like. It was like a, like a sub post office. It it didn't appear to be a proper police station, although it was staffed. 
it was yeah. uh, and that was one of the issues that come because so I like I say I went there in ninety four but by ninety five they were talking about changing the whole policing and all that the the other the other issue that that came while I was there that was very patently obvious I mean I'm next door to Be- to Bexley so we had the uh, BMP oh, bookshop. Yeah, yeah. Well, we had the BNP bookshop and and everything yeah, wrong right. with that. And then next to it, you know, it's Ted Eve's patch, and he wouldn't, you know, right. he, he never ever showed up for anything. But there's no way anybody set foot in his patch without, you know, the the police presence all of a sudden up to ramping up. Yeah. Oh, absolutely, yeah. you know, because it was Ted Eve. And one of the issues was, that, you know, I mean, I come from East London. We'd had gangs, and I'm not talking about a craze. We'd had gangs in East, the East End of London for years, ever since I can remember. But everybody kept to their own patch, and it was very family-dominated, and it was about keeping control of an area. And and effectively, that's what happened in Eltham as well, if you recall Eltham. So you had, there, there were three, and that was the village concept, if you remember. So there was yeah, right. there was your big houses, there was your school, there was your church, there was your doctors, and then there was all the all the family houses. And just down the road, you had the uh, co-op, all the co-op uh, housing estate from from Woolwich Arsenal. Yeah. And, that, yeah. and, that, and so the, the big house at the end was the uh, and no, nobody believes in itself. The big house at the end was where your where the, the supervisor lived. And all of his workforce lived in in the houses down his road. So if anybody didn't turn up for work, they knew why they didn't turn up for work. It was right. it was pretty pretty bizarre. But all of those areas had the gangs, and and everybody knows. I mean, I knew the A courts within six months of going to work in Eltham. We were warned off. There was certain right. areas of of. Elton, you know, if we went canvassing, we went mob handed. You know, 10, 12, 14 people would go out right. knocking on doors because it was just unsafe to do otherwise. Right. And, and what I'm seeing, or, or then, is they were talking about and one of the classics was the fire brigade. And I didn't understand this because the police relied quite heavily on the fire brigade, not for policing, but. You know, it's like there's a, there's an issue. You need the fire brigade to to do whatever they do, and there was a big thing about it, you know even even them being corrupt. And that. you go, how oh, the bloody was a fireman corrupt? And I remember one day it would have been in ninety six, ninety seven. They went to they went to Shooters Hill Fire Station for an inspection, and they opened up all the lockers, and the lockers were full of all the BMP oh, yeah. stuff. Because they were doing the yeah, the, oh, the all stuff. Well, yeah. they effectively oh, had to close Shooters Hill Fire Station down, and and that also had an effect on on the police in Eltham for some reason, because cause Shooters Hill Fire Station is actually in Greenwich. But, it, I mean, it's right next door to, to Elton. It's mm. just, the whole thing yeah. was just bizarre. No, for- and I think, I'm not wow. sure whether whether it's the same today. Here's a question. How did Shooters Hill get its name? It's from the archery. Is it now? There's Archery Road. There's, there's also, this is where supposedly Robin Hood used to go to fire against the King's archers. Hey. Oh, Ox, no, no, no. They used to do it. All the all the royal stuff was done. John will know this in a place called Oxley's Wood. It's an ancient wood, oh, yeah. right on the edge between Bexley and and El- It was part of Eltham. It's Oxley's yeah, Wood, but it's where they all the archers. They used to have all their competitions were yeah. done, and there's all of the all of the roads around there are all named after archery things or the kings or the queens, oh. which is why they... I'll tell you what. Yeah? I'll tell you what, Al. Yeah? By the sound of it, you're a bit older than me because I, I wasn't around in those days. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, but because, excellent, John, because excellent. I, because I was a political organiser, we yeah. had... Oxley's Wood he was, was... He was there against the Plantagenets there, John. Well, I'll tell you why Ox, yeah, exactly. Oxley's Wood was an issue because it was an ancient wood and they were thinking of building the new East London River Crossing ah. and it was gonna go, they right. were going to have to knock down a lump or take away a lump of <laughs> Oxley's Wood and there was a huge, great protest test because it was something like 300 years old or something and and yeah. the best the best anyway, thing Giles, yes 
Sorry, John. Close down now. Let somebody else come on. Thanks very much for that, <laughs> indeed. Good, good to have you with us, John. Thanks for that. Uh, just guys, we'll go ahead and hit the ad break, and then we'll be into the last 10 minutes of today's Viewpoint. Viewpoint on Talk Radio Europe with John Brown. You see, we've segued into, we're going through, we're just going through all ye oldie English place <laughs> names, you know. And, and before anybody comes in about the, the, that well-known something grope something road in the East End. Ha ha road. Ha ha road. Uh, Come on then, tell, tell, tell the boys and girls it's what you the, just told me. It's the drainage ditch. It's the that drainage ditch. Stop the water going down onto the plain, onto the grass area where the archers used to practice, where the, where the king's archers used to practice. So it's just, and it's called Ha Ha Road. Right. That's just proper name. Okay. It's just a tell. ditch by the side of, presumably it was a dirt road and to keep it dry, they built a ditch. Right. Well, there you go. Now, listen, just be for free. free. <laughs> and thank you for that little, that little, <laughs> uh, anyway, let's get, let's, I'm just going to crack on because I just, I've got, I've got uh, nine minutes left of this morning. Nine, five, two. Well, if you want to get your points in before we close up shot today, here are the numbers. To contact TRE, please call 952-78-4000. Email studio at tre.radio. Send us a WhatsApp on plus three four six four five ninety nine sixty seven ninety five. Message us on Facebook, Talk Radio Europe Official, or tweet us at TRE Talk Radio. One of the things I wanted to get, to get across, I'll just put a throw out there as well, because we're not going to touch on Trump. We're not going to touch. We're not going to touch on. We're not going to touch on. <laughs> Yeah, we're not going Trump to Trump is touched. <laughs> well, I mean, his 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 uh, his Hannibal Lecter thing about saying oh, yeah, yeah. it was against. It was against. It was, apparently, the, he's saying that Venezuela is dumping migrants into America, so they should just no, no, them. mentally ill migrants is what he said. Right. Okay. So he's he's, he's it's a win win situation. Oh, Plus, four dimensional chess. That boy, you know that. Pardon. He used to play, people used to phone him and say Trump's playing four dimensional chess. <laughs> Yeah. Right. Uh, moving. <laughs> yeah. Whatever he's doing. Exactly. Um, the w- <laughs> no. There's. there's <laughs> I had the quote. The only person who's do, who's actually did the job they were employed to do under Donald Trump was Stormy Daniels. Now moving swiftly <laughs> onwards. <laughs> <laughs> I thought you'd like that one. Um, that got me taken off air. Um, I thought it was, you know, it made me laugh. Anyway, so, but going, moving away from that, as I am, deftly, uh, like the captain of Titanic, um, looking at the, I was really surprised the way that some of the media reported the the the, the results, the gains of the Greens uh, this time around in London, because you can always tell, trust the Daily Mail to, to, to throw in the, you know, the, the Muslim threat bombshell and because the Green Party had uh, had appealed to the, to the Muslim voters who were against, you know, the Green Party uh, taking a stand, their principal stand against the what's happening in Gaza. And of course, we get the pictures, as you expect, basically uh, what seem, who seem to be, we say, well, not even clerics, but people who were very, very, shall we say, uh, pro-Palestine, screaming and shouting out of Akbar, and that, you know, that that sent the Collywalls up through Middle England. Your thoughts, Alf? Well, it's, oh, London has always been complicated, but London has always delivered for Labour, you know, for many, many years. Yeah. From, from the bad old days when we used to lose... And then, like I say, we won the GLC. Otherwise, there's that glorious period <clears throat> under Thatcher, you mean, that most of us were saying? <laughs> well, that was that was the Livingston area. But then remember that Johnson ended up being the, the leading leader. But he never really... He could con- forget the zip wire. One yeah. of our proudest But he also moment. never really controlled London either. It was controlled by the, uh, the GLC uh, parliamentarians. So, mm. But this time, you know, as much as anything... It, the, the media needs something to to hang on to. Khan was always going to win. Mm. Everybody knew that. So what they do, they slag him off because he's Labour. They slag him off because of Ulez. They slag him off because of Gaza. They slag him off because he's Khan. You know, it's just, they, they just, they had nothing to say about why his policies were wrong. What, why is it? If, if I, you know, again, I, I know I keep banging on about it, but it was a real issue. I lived in East London. I worked I worked in Greenwich. Yeah. Greenwich High Road in the morning was like driving through a fog every day. Because it's so low down by the river, you had all the smog. Now, I know that the young girl, that the woman took her, her claim to court and won, came from Croydon, 
But all the way down, I remember Nick Rainsford, who was the MP for Greenwich when I was there. Nick Rainsford, God. Yeah, 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 he beat Rosie Barnes. Another defector. uh, Crossed the house in the wrong direction. (coughs) But you could, you literally, you pulled up in the car, you couldn't see Anne in front of you. On On a quite clear, sunny summer day. And when you see that, you just understood. I lived in the east end of London. When you come out in the morning, when I was, what, between remembering eight years of age and, say, 14, and you'd walk out the front door and you couldn't see the front gate and that was, like, two yards away. And you'd have to walk up the road to to get a bus to school that, that never arrived, so right. you end up walking to school because of the pea supers. If people don't understand what you, Les, is about and about reducing... You know, all the all the pollution. All you have to do occasionally. I was I was saying to you, Giles, you can go to if you look on the television. It's always Hampstead Heath, but there's a place in Shooters Hill. You can see the whole of London. Yeah. And just go there and tell me how many times you can go to the top of Hampstead Heath and over and you look you overlook the whole of London, not just a bit. You overlook the whole valley. Yeah. And there's this brown. Smog. It's not as bad these days as it used to be, but there's this brown. I know you get it. I tell you where you get it. The same is if you look along the coast at Malaga on a, on a bad day, and all you see is a big brown. It looks. It looks like. Oh, I don't know what it looks like. It looks like something's been burnt and yeah. it's burning brown, and it's this great big brown smog. And you go, that's killing people. Mm. Do you not understand? It's killing people. And people want to complain. Oh, I can't drive my 30-year-old car that's polluting the atmosphere. And, yeah, it's called get a life, people. So I remember when they, and, and how much it cost us all. I remember my dad, you know, we just moved into our house and we had to move from a coal fire to smokeless fuel. So we moved from coal to coke. And then that wasn't good enough. So we had to move to gas. And and so it goes on, but well, I can tell you from the day I moved in, I lived in in people want to look it up. I lived in Fourth Avenue in Manor Park. When I went there, it was smog, loads of days. When I left there, when I was twenty one, we you know fog was out, something that happened maybe once a year, maybe once every other year, and that was the difference. That was about a clean air act. And and so it goes on. So they slag off calm because he's trying to trying to make London less polluted. And people who've lived there go, oh, but you know, it's costing me money. Well, yeah. Just um, just quickly, and and thank you, ladies, ladies and gentlemen. That was the later party broadcast this week. Exactly. Um, just I want to just do quickly about because we talked about it just, but we've got two minutes. Yeah, yeah. Eurovision. <laughs> I smile. It's not Eurovision it's, anymore, is it? It's, well, you know. How, how do you have a Eurovision song contest and you've got Australia? Since when has that been? It's been there a few years, but since when yeah, is Australia? The Dominion, the Dominions and UK oh, and right. Empire. Yeah, so well, let's have it. Yeah, Why exactly. don't have a world division? We'll have but, world division and we won't have all this because there'll be so many conflicts around the world that it'll just but, never go off the ground. I know you, you know, but absolute nonsense. Can you imagine? I'm just thinking Hamas are sitting there watching your region going, great, it's, yeah, okay, yeah. it's okay because, because. Where's our entry? Why weren't we allowed? <laughs> it, yeah. it just the whole the whole thing became, and I just say, listen, the people. I mean, that, the, 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 people the, 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 the girls' parents couldn't travel. Were advised not to travel to watch their daughter at Eurovision. Yeah, yeah. And that just, I'm sorry. I mean, yeah, I know, I know, there's a horrendous things going on in the world. But it's, but it's the way people turn. No different. Yeah, you know, in the in America, they have all the people on the campus who say we're pro Palestine or whatever they argue, and there's all these Jews, uh, Jewish people that are taking part in it, and all do. And you go, yeah, right on. And then all of a sudden, it goes from one campus to fifty campuses, and then all of a sudden, Oxford, mm-hmm. Oxford have got a campsite outside complaining, and you go, since when have the people going to Oxford? Uh, you know, since when has Oxford University had any issue to do with Gaza, Israel? We're going to stop the Jewish community from going to university. Yeah, right. That's We're going to, going to stop the Arabs from going to local schools. You know, you go to North London. I, I tell you, it's, some of it's horrific. 
go to... It's never been the same since, since ABBA, I think, basically. <laughs> Alf, well, yes, yeah, absolutely. You know, because, hey, you know... Absolutely. I mean, oh, I it wouldn't be allowed to get away with that now because it, it, it's about the French getting beaten, and that would be... No, it's just about war. Can you imagine a song these days about war? With a, with a catchy, with, with those Well, with a catchy soon and all that. And we all love ABBA, but, you know, it was a song about war and it won. First band I ever saw live. Anyway, on that <laughs> bombshell, true story, Bingley Hall. In that, parents took me. On that Bingley bombshell, Hall. Bingley Hall. Bingley Hall. Bingley Hall. I know where Bingley Hall is. Right, right then, Alf. I've around. been to Bingley Hall. And on that bombshell, <laughs> <laughs> Alf, thank no you so much. It's been... It's been another, another explosion. Another explosion. Al, thanks so much for your time today. And you, Giles. Thank this you This show will be much. repeated. And everybody. Thank you. This show will be repeated at 7 o'clock. Stephen Ritson, who is not sure what concert he first went to see, but anyway, is up <laughs> next. Express. 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 My invited studio guests and callers do not constitute an opinion endorsed in any way by Talk Radio Europe. You've been listening to a TRE production. If you've enjoyed this program, there'll be another episode waiting for you next week, right here on this platform, where you can also access our extensive back catalogue of shows and interviews. For more information on our live programming, social media channels and apps, and how to contact Talk Radio Europe, please visit tre.radio.